Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back. Um, we've just had the pleasure of hearing from the U.S. Ambassador to Mexico and Mexico's Ambassador to the United States. And now we're going to get to hear from some uh, ex distinguished and very experienced diplomats from both Mexico and the United States talking about the challenges of managing this relationship from a governmental perspective. Um, across the borders, between capitals and between borders. And as, as we know, those perspectives are sometimes the same and sometimes a little bit different. But we're very, very pleased to have with us uh, Catherine Duholm, who is the Director of Mexican Affairs at the, at the State Department and, and for a while also served as Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Mexico and Central America and has a long diplomatic career working in various parts of the U.S. government and various parts of the world for the State Department. So it's great to have you with us here, Catherine. Thank you. And we have Gina Barquet on, on joining us virtually from the Embassy of Mexico. She also uh, has a, a distinguished career working in the Mexican Foreign Service, the Mexican Diplomatic Service, and is currently the head of Borders Border and Special Affairs at the Embassy of Mexico here in the United States in uh, Washington. And Chris Andino is uh, with us from the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement at the, uh, at the State Department. And for the State Department, that bureau handles a lot of our security, justice, and law enforcement relationship, especially in the training and capacity building and coordination side, and then coordinating with the justice and law enforcement agencies um, in the United States and in Mexico. So it's, it's great to have all of you with us. I'd like to invite each of you to make some initial remarks, and then maybe we can delve a little bit deeper into some, some of the issues that uh, are very important to manage. So, um, Catherine, if I could ask you to start off, please. Wonderful. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you very much to you for hosting. It's a pleasure to be here in person. We've done a number of events virtually, so nice to actually be here in person and delighted that there are people still able to join virtually. That's a, a great asset of what we've all been through in the last several years. Um, but huge thanks to the Mexico Institute, to Andrew and to Cecily and to the whole team for putting this together. Um, it's a hugely important issue to take some real time and delve into and discuss. The border region with, between the U.S. and Mexico is its own animal. It is absolutely a defining feature of the relationship. It is essential to both U.S. and Mexican prosperity and security. Um, I know you all have been hearing statistics all day long, so I will just, you know, focus on the 1.2 billion in trade that's estimated to cross over daily, uh, depending on how you calculate it. So it's certainly a vital, vital part of uh, our economy, our security, and our relationship. So just to say a few words about the coordination at the federal level. You know, I'd like to zoom out for a moment because while this conference has been focused on the very specific area of the, the border, all of the relationship and the cooperation that is necessary is basically supported by a whole network of cooperation. And I'm not going to elaborate or go too into detail, but I would like to just set a, a bit of a framework and a context, particularly because we have had just in the last weeks some very timely uh, engagements that really provide some support and some uh, interweaving fabric to, to provide the kind of uh, context and relationship that we need to build a healthy and strong border. The Summit of the Americas process, I'm sure that most folks in this room were aware of that. Uh, certainly a very big effort. The U.S. and Mexico very much engaged there, and there were a number of agreements there that will help provide support to our ongoing border relationships. When you look at the fact that the Los Angeles Declaration, we agreed to provide support um, for migrants and refugees to the tune of $314 million from the U.S. side, cooperating with our partners in the region. Um, we also agreed to provide um, some legal pathways for more migration under the agricultural H-2A program through uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, we're providing $65 million in legal assistance to help make that happen. 
Um, and we've also agreed to work to prevent uh, human trafficking and smuggling operations. So those are some of the kinds of things that take place in a very broad context, looking at the Summit of the Americas. Zooming in a little bit, you see the, uh, the North American Leaders Summit process, which also helped to provide some real strength and support to this process. And uh, there are over 50 different areas of focus for that, so I will not go into them. But uh, I will just note that there are some real areas of emphasis that have applicability for some of the, uh, the issues that are discussed in this type of a forum, including looking at our health supply chains, looking at how we identify critical industries that we can keep operating across the borders, as well as making sure that we're sharing critical information, such as passenger uh, recognition name, da name data. So all of those kinds of things are happening in a trilateral context. Very important there as well. But what I suspect is much more of interest to this group is what's happening bilaterally. And I would just want to highlight that over the past year, we've established two different new areas of cooperation that go directly to interest in the border community. One is through our high-level security dialogue. Uh, and under that rubric, we have met at the ministerial level and have agreed to the bicentennial framework. And I know Chris will go a great deal more into that. So I will, I will leave that for him. But we did, under that rubric, decide to focus on three critical areas of cooperation, which include protecting our people, preventing trans-border crime, and pursuing criminal networks. So obviously, there's a great deal of border significance to those areas, um, and particularly, obviously, on the trans-border crime prevention aspect. So, very much under the HLSD, which is the successor to the Merida Agreement um, that we built upon and modernized to help deal with today's challenges. So the, the HLSD and its bicentennial framework provide us a real opportunity for coordinating um, at the federal level between the U.S. and Mexico to address very critical security issues at the border. Under the high-level economic dialogue, we also have agreed to address a number of issues that have relevance here. Um, the high-level economic dialogue is focused on, we have about 12 different deliverables currently and are looking to develop new areas of cooperation going forward. But we're very focused on supply chain issues, which certainly come into play at the border in, in significant form. Uh, we're also looking at how to best integrate our economies and looking to facilitate all of that through the high-level economic dialogue. The economic dialogue also has a specific area for trade facilitation, and that includes things like prioritizing infrastructure at the border, um, supporting our already existing dialogues on that matter, as well as looking at how we can do things to help facilitate trade, such as unified cargo processing, and looking at how to expand the Trusted Traveler program. So those are all initiatives that we are taking up under the high-level economic dialogue. Those are two very significant bilateral uh, dialogues and new initiatives we have just started. There's already, though, however, one that I'm sure you all are quite familiar with that's specifically focused on the border. So the 21st Century Border Initiative and the BBBXG, I always have to make sure I count and get all of the Bs in there, um, Bilateral Borders and Bridges and Crossings Commission, or whatever the rest of it is. Um, we have been pursuing that effort as well, but I, before I talk about where we are in that process, I want to highlight that we have had a game changer in that process. And that was in November of last year when Congress passed the Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act. That provided $2 billion worth of funds for new infrastructure at the border. And that's new infrastructure, modernizing old infrastructure, and addressing some security and law enforcement issues at the border. So that really is, we've been talking about, a generational opportunity. Very rarely do we get that kind of unified congressional support for such a major investment in our borders. 
So we have continued the 21st century border process. Um, in fact, we've been augmenting our normal meetings. In just uh, the last month, we've had two very significant meetings, one in mid-May, uh, which Ambassador Salazar and Foreign Secretary Abrard uh, met with a broad group in Tijuana to discuss some of the opportunities presented by the Infrastructure Act and how we might identify priorities in that regard. We then had a follow-up meeting just last week uh, that was more of a technical nature, and we also specified a few areas of focus to delve into for the purposes of that conversation and had a targeted public component where we had about 100 different uh, participants to address specific interest in the, uh, in the border process at this point. So we do plan to continue forward with the regular BBBXG and 21st century process. We will be announcing dates for those regular meetings uh, in the very near future and look forward to doing complete reviews of all of the ports of entry and where we stand on all of those and getting public input into uh, how we best move forward in addressing the operations and, uh, and, and the infrastructure status in those areas. So there is a lot going on, a lot of areas of cooperation, and I know that uh, Gina and Chris have a lot to add to that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gina, could I ask you to offer some comments next, and then we'll have Chris add on. Sure, good afternoon. I would like to thank the Mexico Institute of the Woodrow Wilson Center and the Border Trade Alliance for inviting me to participate in this panel. It is an honor to share this discussion with Catherine Duholm, Chris and Dino, and yourself, Ambassador Wei. The dynamic interaction at the border reflects a resilient institutional framework that Mexico and the United States have created. In 1983, both countries designed a long lasting mechanism named the Binational Bridges and Border Crossing Group, also known as BBBXG. I, I myself have to count the three Bs as well, <laughs> where they agreed on long-term infrastructure projects. This mechanism facilitated the coordination, modernization, and construction of state-of-the-art ports of entry that facilitated border crossings. The BBBXG is one of the oldest mechanisms that has not only endured the test of time, but has also overcome different political visions that have aimed to change the border's role. Today, I want to acknowledge all the attendees at the panel who have also participated in the BBBXG public meeting for providing essential information that has been taken into consideration by federal authorities when outlining their short and long-term action plans. One of the greatest strengths of the BBBXG has been that the federal agencies have embraced the importance of having public panels where promoters and local authorities share their visions related to the importance of each project. Almost 30 years after the BBBXG was created in 2010, Taking into consideration the importance of facilitating lawful, secure, and efficient movement of goods and people, both countries deepened and expanded their institutional cooperation. We created the 21st Century Border Management Steering Committee, which constituted a broader framework that would assist in managing the border by reducing the cost of trade, increasing security, and reducing wait times for the local population who cross the border as part of their daily activities. The 21st century border encompassed three subcommittees that would enhance economic competitiveness, facilitate trade, and exchange information. It is worth noting that the Security and Law Enforcement Subcommittee, based on the principle of shared responsibility and mutual trust, implemented an action plan to disrupt and dismantle transnational criminal organizations' activity at the border region. Today, this joint actions and specific security operations are also strengthened through the bicentennial framework with different groups focused on combating arms and drug trafficking, amongst others. To ensure trade facilitation, the 21st century border set its infrastructure priorities on those established by the BBBXG. It reduced wait times by coordinating efforts to harmonize manifestos, have joint inspections, and create trust shipper and traveler programs. Furthermore, both countries agreed to implement pre-screening, pre-clearance, and pre-inspection programs which have increased the efficiency in detecting and seizing illegal goods. Currently, law enforcement agencies share real-time information and local risk assessments 
to implement and coordinate joint patrolling along the border. The management of the border based on intense federal coordination allows for one of the most dynamic regions in the world. Every day, an average of 1.6 million people cross the border in both directions to travel, shop, work, go to school, do business, and receive medical treatment. In addition, more than 80% of our bilateral trade crosses the border, which is equivalent to exchanging $1 million per minute. As Catherine Duhill mentioned, this can vary. We can go through 1 million to 1.2 million, but we usually just leave it at 1 million just to make an overall average. In this past year, the renovated high-level economic dialogue focused explicitly on strengthening binational cooperation in developing state-of-the-art ports of entry that will maximize the border's trading potential by making the crossings of goods and people more agile. For this reason, the government of Mexico is adamantly supporting the development of Otay Mesa East. In addition, in different fora, we are underscoring the importance of constructing the Laredo 4-5 port of entry to increase even further the existing trade in Laredo and strengthen the economic pull that it has become. Furthermore, within the high-level economic dialogue, both countries agree that they have the responsibility to create infrastructure and facilitate trade to make sure we take advantage of the full potential of the border. USMCA expanded the possibilities of trade Thus, we must implement policies and invest in border infrastructure to expand supply chains and generate production hubs in the region that specialize in specific sectors for the benefit of both countries. The importance of the border is unsurmountable. You really have to live it to understand it. It has become a strategic asset for the bilateral relationship in this polarized and trying global context. It should never be considered a symbol of division, but a source of, for connectivity. As governments, we seek to enable regional supply chains, strengthen the binational labor force, and foster our shared cultural and social identity. The US-Mexico border is a front row witness to North American economic integration. For this reason, we must continue strengthening the existing mechanisms to ensure the construction and modernization of ports of entry and high-level technology to guarantee efficient and secure crossings. To achieve this, we must also strengthen the collaboration between federal, state, and local authorities to ensure that coordination is thorough and practical and to guarantee that local agents' needs are understood and incorporated into national action plans. We must look into the future. The next step is to incorporate new aspects such as environmental issues and address them binationally. We must integrate the region further and concentrate on ports of entry and the surrounding cities. Our focus should be on constructing efficient roads and highways that communicate ports of entry with production hubs. We must contribute to urbanizing the border to include developmental aspects that may deepen social, economic, and political aspects. As federal authorities, we must work with our regional and local counterparts to encourage the development of specialized cities to promote. Plus, we must explore new ways to generate policies that reduce pollution and consider the efficient use and recycling of natural resources. Through a profound institutionalization of our everyday relationships, we must guarantee that the management of the border will continue to endure the test of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chris, please add some thoughts from your perspective. Well, those are both tough acts to follow. Uh, and uh, so perhaps I'll, I'll just offer a short comments and we can get to things in, in question and answer. Uh, I want to highlight two, two issues that I think build on, on both what Gina and, and Catherine have, have talked about. Um, I first worked on Mexico in Catherine's office maybe 10 years ago, uh, and at the time there was a very senior and distinguished U.S. ambassador resident in Mexico City uh, who, who currently is sitting to my right, and I want to thank him and the entire Mexico Institute for, uh, for arranging this event today. Um, as a career economics officer, that ambassador, uh, I, re I remember at the time the Wilson Center had the, the Twin Cities or the Sister Cities uh, economic analysis uh, that, that we would look at to just see the value of the border as a dynamic engine for North America. Uh, and at the time, we, we didn't really have that same sense or sensibility around security issues. 
And we had two separate structures. We had the high-level economic dialogue and the high-level security dialogue. And so I was particularly gratified when I was starting in my job last year, uh, coming into to INL, which you know people joke is the Drugs and Thugs Bureau, but uh, is, is much more than that. We work on rule of law issues as well. Uh, to have the opportunity to talk to the Wilson Center and to Ambassador Wayne and his, his former counterpart uh, in the Mexican institution, uh, the former uh, Foreign Secretary Meade, uh, in an event that the Wilson Center held. Uh, and this is before the Bicentennial Framework came out. And we were talking about border issues and the future of the then Merida Initiative. And uh, I was encouraged by, that that group was talking about that these aren't separate issues, that the security and economic issues are intrinsically connected. Uh, and in fact, I think there was an encouragement from that august group to, to not think about uh, security and economic issues as being in competition. Uh, but rather to see how we could be discussing these things as mutually supportive solutions. Uh, and so I, I will embarrass Catherine, I think, a little bit, because as she talked about protecting, preventing, and pursuing criminals, I, I remember being on the seventh floor of the State Department when she came up with those three Ps uh, in, in a hallway as we were leaving a, a meeting. Uh, but I think it reflects the work of people that are in this room, people that are on the border, people that are in both capitals over decades of reframing the way that we, that we view uh, our, our shared border as a dynamic engine to support jobs, economy, and, and North American security. In support of that, INL several years ago uh, started down a new path that I think is perfectly coincident with the new Bicentennial Framework. And I, I'll zoom in on the second goal of the Bicentennial Framework, which is to prevent transborder crime. And included in there, if you look at the Bicentennial Framework, you'll see that it's not just about the land border. It's ensuring that we work together to secure all entries uh, to, to North America, to secure supply chains, uh, and that supports the nearshoring and, and reshoring uh, that, that I think both countries are, are dedicated to. But within that framework uh, and, and with that approach, uh, we launched a, a study with the Sandia National Laboratories in cooperation with ANAM or, or SAT in, uh, in the Mexican side and with CBP here about 18 months ago. We have an initial draft back now uh, that we're, we're going over with both governments right now to kind of look and see what's in there. None of the findings are going to be surprising, but what they've done is that they've, for the first time that I know of, uh, INL certainly is modeling how a more secure, more efficient, better supported border region uh, can, one, enhance uh, our ability to clear uh, personal operated vehicles and cargo traffic more efficiently to reduce the wait times, but also increase through defense in depth and information sharing that both of our governments are, are dedicated to, uh, to ensure that we have uh, a even more secure uh, supply chain. The, when we kind of started on this process, one of the recommendations that comes out of this, and I think it's per perfectly coincident with what Gina is talking about, is, is looking at model ports. Uh, we already have this idea of unified cargo processing, but there, there are model ports on the international system for seaports. There are model ports uh, in the international system. ICAO has standards for, for airports, uh, but there's no international body that has global recommendations for how to manage a land port of entry. Uh, certainly not one as frequently crossed uh, and important as the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, and so really the Sandia study was meant to put numbers and data and modeling uh, behind uh, how, how we should best approach that. I don't think any of the findings are, are going to be surprising. It's by doing, by being smarter on the border, we can increase security, we can reduce wait times, we can increase revenue uh, for, for customs agencies. But I think having, knowing how to prioritize those issues will help both federal governments engage with communities on the border to figure out how to prioritize uh, the interventions that, that we, we seek to make. That study is happening in concert with uh, a separate study that we're supporting uh, through, I'm sorry to bring up a competitor here, but the Atlantic Council. Um, the, uh, and we've, we've just had our first event in, in El Paso, uh, and we're going to have several more events uh, along the border and in both capitals, uh, focusing on the economic uh, impacts and, and benefits, not just to the border region, but frankly into Middle America, Central Mexico, Southern Mexico, of increasing efficiency and security at our border. I, I think this is a crowd that is convinced that this is right, and what we're seeking to do is have a scientific method behind that. 
so that we can justify, uh, as what Catherine is saying here, with the $2 billion investments and, and those, you know, the grano de arena that, that the United States through INL might have uh, on, on the Mexican side to assist in building systems to better communicate, to create a better network between both federal governments for sharing information and securing the border. So I'll leave my comments there, but I'm, we're very excited about where this is because I, it, it really puts in the proper frame, which is the economic frame and the job support frame, the security work that we're seeking to do. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chris. Thanks all of you. Um, I think that uh, both administrations deserve uh, congratulations for setting up a framework and a series of processes and dialogues that can really allow progress to take place. And of course, now the challenge is to get that those those results. As one unnamed ambassador, not me, mentioned in just a few minutes ago, it's to get the the results coming out of that. So let me just start off and ask a question about security, one about infrastructure, and then one about migration, also. So on, let me start off with security, since this is one that 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 sadly is, is resulting in tens of thousands of deaths and, and other harm on both sides of the border. What should we be looking for as some initial results from our new bicentennial framework and this new collaboration for, that has been has been established? It's not that old, I understand, but but people are dying and people are suffering. So how should we measure, consider measuring progress as we move forward in the months ahead? What should we look for? Maybe I'll start and then, you know, I think we made a historic shift uh, nearly 20 years ago at this point by talking about the shared responsibility that both countries have to, to securing our citizens. Uh, and I think fundamentally the most important metric on both sides are our lives lost and impacted whether that's through synthetic drugs here in the united states and and the real crisis uh, that we have or whether that's homicides in mexico uh, at the hands of of um, smuggled smuggled arms um, and i think the bicentennial framework really gives us a a the means through which we can both address these uh politically diplomatically and programmatically um, but, but fundamentally, I think the metric is going to be in lives. Um, both require new approaches. I think, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want to get ahead of the policy, but like everybody else, I'm reading what the Senate is doing uh, right now. And, and, you know, one of the, the elements that I, I saw in the, uh, the bill that they voted yesterday to, on a motion to proceed includes uh, arms trafficking issues. And so there are, there is this clear that the United States is focused, and, and we also seek to support programs through INL on, on how we can assist uh, in providing information and connection back to the United States to investigate those kinds of crimes. I think the, the challenge on synthetics uh, is, is, is one that is unique, and it's novel. Um, this is not, uh, you know, if you've been working on counter-narcotics in Latin America, you think in metric ton loads. Um, uh, a kilogram of fentanyl can kill 500,000 people. That's a shoebox. That's the drone that you buy on Amazon. And so it requires a new approach, and frankly it requires one that, uh, that we have to think of how we interact with, uh, with industry, uh, how we interact with you know, chemical suppliers and producers. And so I think the Bicentennial Framework, through its very broadening of uh, who is involved in the conversation, gives us means to do that. It also helps refocus both of us, and I think going back to the first goal of, of protecting our people, uh, one of the most important changes, I think, in the Bicentennial Framework is a focus on public health. Uh, the fentanyl and synthetics problem in the United States is a public health crisis. Uh, and I think, one, we recognize that, and two, we can share best practices between both countries and in a North American context, also with our Canadian partners. And so I think that's a changed approach uh, right now. I don't know if you have other thoughts than those. Yeah, I, I think certainly that broad vision and measuring in lives is very much what we want to be about. And I think it's worth noting that some of the key differences between what the Bicentennial Framework offers uh, from Merida is an emphasis on some of these areas that Chris mentioned, the public health perspective. That was something that was very important um, to the president. President Lopez Obrador's administration was focusing more on public health, focusing also on the arms trafficking side of things. For us, it's extreme, extremely important 
that not only are we delivering on some of the same security needs that we've had for some time, but that we address this fentanyl issue. Um, we are starting to see some early results. We've got action plans that we've agreed to with the Mexicans. Um, but we have started to see things like, for instance, um, some of the work that uh, Chris's office has been supporting for a long time through the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms um, has been the E-Trace system mm -hmm. that allows us to trace um, arms that are discovered in Mexico. And we now, through this increased emphasis, we have seen a record number of referrals back to ATF from that program. So we're really seeing some doubling down on, on cooperation that has been available, but there's a new dedication to it, I think, as a result of this framework. On the other side of it, because we as the U.S. government have really committed to taking a look at this and have this um, tra arms trafficking working group, mm -hmm. been able to collaborate and, and do some real investigations, and we're able to get um, a sentencing for an arms trafficker from the U.S. of 12 years, and that's, I, I think, the first that we've had um, in recent memory. So those are some real results in recent months. Um, we've also begun to see an uptick in uh, some of the uh, the um, interception of fentanyl on the Mexican side of things. Um, there's still a lot more emphasis we would like to see, but we're starting to see results. Good. That's very helpful. Gina, do you have anything to you want to add on this? Uh, sure. I, I definitely agree that the main metric would be the to avoid any loss in lives. But I think this opens a very wide and discussions that we have had on how to measure it with quantitative terms and qualitative terms. So quantitatively, it's very easy to see the seizures and to see the, the to actually count whatever we, we can do at the border and, and actually see the progress that are being made regarding seizures, regarding detection of arms trafficking. But I would like to go into the detail of the qualitative, the fact that we're sitting down and that we've managed to do this high level uh, security group and this bicentennial framework is huge. And sometimes it's very hard to actually put a metric into the level of trust that we're having and the daily interaction that every agency is having. And that actually go, leads to a better tracing, as you mentioned, with the E-Trace. So that's where we, we need to emphasize that. And when we actually promote the high level security dialogue, that that's another aspect that should be taken into consideration and not only focus on seizures and those that are e easy numbers that we can talk about it and we can and, and we can discuss but also the other big aspect of it is how much we are cooperating daily and as you mentioned at the border it, it's not only the crossings that go through and the one million dollars it's the entire interaction and dynamic that working together as both countries, federal level and institutionalizing the relationship, that we're really making an impact that maybe it's harder to quantify, but that the impact is, is there. Thank you very much. I think you're, ex you're exactly right to emphasize trust, that trust is going to be essential here and, and that trust deteriorated in recent years. And now if we can build that back up, we have a framework, then you can achieve a lot of things. And those studies, Chris, that you mentioned can be really helpful in that because we've suspected these things all along could be done if we could get both sides to agree to invest in the infrastructure on the border, which leads me to my next question, infrastructure. So could you give us a, a description of, of the time frame within which you think we're going to be working to get agreement on both sides of the border of, of top priorities of, of this generational opportunity and and start seeing things happen in communities along along the border as you can imagine as you know there's a lot of impatience in this room at Elsa they'd like to see it right now but it takes time and historically it has been terribly difficult to get interagency agreement on either side of the border, which in my time led to that bridge that went to nowhere up in Chihuahua, mm -hmm. and then the, the uh, dedicated effort of two cabinet members to get that railroad crossing finished uh, between Texas and Mexico also, and it took two of the months to get that done. So 
give us a little hope and a time frame here as how you see this this working going forward. I know it's not easy, but set some some parameters for us or give us a, some hope. Sure. Well, we actually have been making real progress in that regard as well. Um, the meetings that I mentioned that happened in May and June were very solid steps in that direction. And I, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised to know that we actually have some initial um, combined thoughts on what the priority should be. Um, we are still working to you know, move those through and, and get firm agreement, but there's pretty good consensus on what the areas of priority should be. So um, we will obviously need to move forward with the necessarily involved and somewhat long process of, of taking all the due diligence steps and having uh, all of the contracting work done. And certainly we can't give any estimates for how long that process will take until there are contracts available to take a look at. Um, but in terms of an agreement on how to focus and move forward, we, we're pretty well headed in that direction. Good, good. Gina, anything you want to add from your perspective? No, I, I totally agree. The joint cooperation and the back and forth and, and actually establishing which ones are our priorities. As I mentioned, the BBBXG and the 21st century border and the priorities that were set in the high level economic dialogue are really a, a guide of where we're going to. And the deep uh, studies that I have done to widen bridges, to modernize, and to create some are actually focused in making that dynamic between crossing of goods and people more agile and trying to satisfy the demand of each uh, region and locality along the border. So in this sense, I note that a key part of the process is having stakeholders be involved and have opportunities to come in. And as Chris mentioned, even without mentioning that rival institution, that's exactly the right thing to do for all aspects of U.S.-Mexico relations. For USMCA, for the North America, is find a way to have enough stakeholder involvement that you can get valuable input and that it's doable for the few of you who are working on this, because there are many more stakeholders that care about the relationship than there are government officials working on it. Um, so I, I think it is important, as you mentioned, that you have these opportunities for people to come in and, and uh, express their opinions and be involved on a, on a regular basis as you go forward. And, and I, I'm assuming that will be built in as this goes ahead. Absolutely, yes, we will, we will be proceeding, as Gina mentioned, with the BBBXG process. Um, I think we'll probably be looking to follow similar models as we did before, where we deal with one section of the border and then the other section in, in probably two different groups. I think we'll probably have something, we've, we've not gotten to dates yet, but probably something in the fall um, to take a look at a, a certain subset of, uh, of ports of entry and then probably early in the following year. Um, for the next, but we very much value the uh, public engagement, the stakeholder involvement. It is, as you mentioned, Ambassador, absolutely essential, and we rely on it and welcome it and, uh, and look forward to announcing those dates for opportunities to have those engagements. Good. Thank you. So let me just say, ask a little something about migration. I know we can't answer all migration questions right here, but it is built into our border cooperation. It's built into the high-level economic dialogue. Um, working together, the two countries working together on root causes, which is going to take a long time. We understand that. But maybe give, give us a, if you could give us a snapshot of where is the collaboration now? What could we look for both on the border and then also continuing this work vis-a-vis -vis Central America and, and other countries? Because as we've heard, there are many other migrants, as we know, there are many migrants coming from many places. And, and then also in that sense, Mexico's southern border, and as LA just talked about, Los Angeles Summit, others helping in this process. Mm -hmm. That's a lot I know, but maybe share a few thoughts as to where we are. Absolutely. Now, I'm happy to do that. I do want to perhaps let Gina, um, if she'd like to, to open up with that, because that's been a particular area of focus for President Lopez Obrador. So if, if okay. you'd like Great. to open us up with that, Gina, and then I'm happy to contribute where, where we see it from the U.S. side. Um, as you all know, the, the main uh, priority and the main focus is to address the root causes of migration. We have been working on that 
throughout the three years of President Lopez Obrador administration and really understanding and trying to assess what is needed to actually uh, satisfy the needs and, and address the root causes of migration. And because otherwise, all we're going to keep on doing is managing migration at the border, but we're really not uh, solving the issue. And with a very humane perspective and understanding the social and the economic uh, roots, we can actually do it in a comprehensive way and in, 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 in a long term. So that's been the the overall perspective, but we're also very open in trying to manage this migration and trying to make it orderly and humane. And we are looking at different trends and how it's increasing and trying to be very specific in how we can generate programs and implement those programs for the benefit of the population that, that is migrating. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I would um, echo what Gina said here in terms of the cooperation being very strong. Um, I've actually said that as much as I think people view migration as potentially a, a problem in the relationship, I would, I would kind of take the other perspective and say I think that our cooperation on migration has been so good and so strong that I think it's strengthened the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we have wonderful interactions. We, we view this issue as a shared set of challenges and opportunities. And uh, it's very much a point of close collaboration between the U.S. and Mexican governments. We talk at least weekly, if not more frequently than that, specifically on migration issues and responding to whatever challenges may be immediately before us and thinking long term as well. Uh, we've collaborated very closely to look at how to manage the flows of various populations from around the region, indeed from around the world, to try to make sure that we're better able to regulate those who are coming through the region and, and seeking to migrate. Uh, so there's been great cooperation in that regard. There's been a lot of focus on the root causes uh, of migration and how to address that. Uh, the Biden administration from the outset laid out a very ambitious plan to address the root causes of migration, um, committing $4 billion to uh, try to really make a difference, particularly in the region of Northern Central America. And that effort is focused on looking at the issues of transparency and governance, how to ensure that people can have trust in their governments and that governance serves um, the re citizens of the region well. That's a major focus. There's also the issue of security, how people can feel safe at home and look to uh, keep their families there, and then the economic drivers. Uh, how do we offer people a vision of their futures in their home countries so that they can choose to stay there? So that's been the focus for the Biden administration. There's a very nice intersection between the Biden administration's emphasis and President Lopez Obrador's interest in addressing the root causes of migration. Um, the Mexican government through MXSEED has got a program to address opportunities um, in Northern Central America to help build economic futures with Sembrando Vidas and um, Construindo uh, jóvenes, jóvenes, Construindo El Futuro. And we have worked between USAID and MXSEED to cooperate in how the U.S. government can help support some of those efforts. We're doing things like um, working with some of the farmers that are supported uh, through Sembrando Vidas to help bring some of the products that they're producing to market so that they are even further strengthened in the assistance that they're getting from the Mexican government. We are also um, expanding our efforts in the region as well. Uh, there was just the Central American Job Corps that was announced through uh, the Summit of the Americas. And I would you know, just note that we have already, by our accounts, um, created 70,000 jobs in Northern Central America. So that is a serious investment in trying to offer an economic future for would-be migrants. Um, we, in 2021's budget, spent $816 million. For 2022, we've allocated $861 million. And then looking ahead to 2023, we're, um, the budget request is for $1 billion. And for, for Central, Northern Tier, Central America? Yes. Yes. So very significant for all, yeah. <laughs> for all of Central America, but with a focus on, on Northern Central America. Yeah. 
That's a lot. Um, so yeah, very much a, a significant focus there. Um, we have programs that I could get into more detail, but in the interest of time, I will, I will pass. But just to say that um, we share Mexico's focus on creating economic opportunities and are collaborating really well in that regard. Well, that's good to hear. Um, I'll take any questions from uh, the audience here. Let's start right over here, please. Maybe um, identify yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, Edgar Guillaume from Constellation Brands. Um, you mentioned um, collaboration and big um, capital investment in infrastructure uh, along the border, which, which is great. Um, and also we think that the high level economic dialogue is the great of the best platform to bring this uh, the discussion. Um, what about uh, common criteria or a harmonized uh, system for um, essential industries? We, we face a major disruption on the supply chain given the different criteria in Canada, US, and Mexico, and eventually we will have to face another similar situation. As long as we can build this criteria, common ground, I think we will be in a much better position to deal with, uh, with a crisis. So I would like to, to know your, your thoughts on this. Right. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. It is a really important area, as we have seen over the last couple of years. If we weren't clear on that before, we certainly are now. Uh, looking at essential industries is essential. Um, what I would say is that we have a number of um, areas of focus that we can look at this through, one of which is the USMCA. The USMCA has got a committee that is looking specifically at this and is working to undertake the definition of what are essential industries. So that will be managed under the USMCA side of things. There is also, under the NALS rubric, an effort to make sure that we have the ability to have interconnectivity between the governments of North America to intervene, not intervene, that's, that's too strong a word, but to, to communicate clearly amongst government officials when there are challenges to essential industries and how, what we can do to keep things flowing. So that's, that's looking at how do we maintain those channels of communication. And then from the um, high level economic dialogue perspective, what we're looking to do is, is get kind of specific and to anticipate what types of challenges might occur and how do we best prepare for them. Um, we are planning um, to go to get down at the very um, practical level and try to figure out what are the biggest vulnerabilities and how do we build our preparedness in the event of supply chain disruptions. So we have a multifaceted approach to it. Uh, and certainly recognize it is absolutely a critical area for us to focus on and, and be able to withstand any challenges to our infrastructure and, and supply chains in the future. Thank you. Yeah, that's very helpful. And I noticed the uh, USMCA also announced they're going to do an emergency plan together also under the competitiveness com committee yes. the other day. So that's all very important. In the back, please, far back. Hi, Patricia Franz, DOJ. This question is directed to Chris. How does the HLSD, the new initiative, impact INL programming in a way that maybe is different from the Merida initiative? Sure. Uh, you know, I'll say that I think our approach over the last several years, and certainly uh, over the last three years with the uh, Lopez Obrador administration, uh, and maybe even stepping back from that, uh, our cooperation with Mexico through INL has always been highly collaborative. Uh, it's it's kind of demand driven, and we've this is now the third sexenio uh, in which we have had a strong cooperation uh, between the Department of State and and the government of Mexico in supporting rule of law uh, and counter narcotics and anti crime uh, programs. So I think perhaps the better framework for me to think about this is that. What we've done bilaterally in the past nine months is is more kind of institutionalized the framework under which we were kind of already working, which is a, a broader rubric to approach our shared challenges. Um, for example, uh, you know, going in that first goal area, 
uh, of protecting our people. This is something that we've been working on together uh, for some time, and we're, we're basically highlighting it more to our public uh, and expanding the number of partners that we're bringing in. So, so for example, when speaking about the public health impacts, uh, Department of State, I don't really think that much about SAMHSA, uh, which the Substance Abuse Mental Health Security Administration, I think. Uh, but I don't think about SAMHSA in my daily life. But I need to if I'm going to be focused on the public health impacts of, of a drug epidemic in, in, in both countries. And so I think what, what we're doing is, is one, kind of capturing the evolution of the cooperation between the, the two states, uh, but also uh, really bringing in those partners in a, in a more sustained way. I think there are core elements of the Bicentennial Framework that look very familiar. Uh, if you've been working on Mexico for some time. And I think particularly, uh, you know, if you look in goal three, uh, that's a lot of the, the areas of cooperation that I think people think of when they think security cooperation uh, between states. But, but in a relationship as dynamic and as important as the U.S.-Mexico one, I, I think that it, it was really important that we capture the much broader sense in which, in which we're operating. So in terms of immediate change, it, it's more showing the public what we've already been doing uh, in terms of our programming. Gene, I just wanted to give you, if you had want to say anything about the last two questions, please. Uh, I wanted to add with the Bicentennial Framework, I think another huge aspect that we, are, we incorporated was cybersecurity mm -hmm. and the fact that both countries acknowledged that arms trafficking, drug trafficking, uh, trafficking in persons also, is also occurring in the deep web and that we have to trace it there and go after illicit financing to actually ensure a, a broader aspect of security cooperation to protect our people even better. The fact that we acknowledge that new arena and we move forward to that in a very proactive way made this uh, bicentennial framework stronger and, and gives us a lot of room for improvement and for further collaboration. Yeah, Gina, you're right. That's a vital area. It was one of the most frustrating areas I tried to work on during my time because neither of our agencies on either side of the border could make much progress on that illicit financing. So hopefully we can now in this new era find better ways to go forward. Final question, please. All right, thank you. This question is for Catherine. Uh, we've developed a uh, collaborative um integrated or vertically integrated ecosystem for agro uh, that focuses on sustainability is not a luxury but a, a requirement or a, a necessity. And that ecosystem could use, because it's a collaborative effort, could use some of your programs. How do we get or how do we take advantage of these programs? And I'm sorry, is this from an individual company perspective or? or well, it is an individual company perspective, but uh, we, we're working with universities. We're working with the Secretary of uh, Agriculture in Mexico, and we're working with um, a lot of different people. Uh, and we're basically focusing around uh, small and medium-sized growers for just developing their capabilities of importing into the United States. Um, one of the large projects that we've got in mind right now is what we're calling a uh, packed, uh, packed order for the last mile. Uh, and, and our plan is to do a multi-phase, one million square foot facility in the border some, you know, someplace. Right now we haven't determined exactly where that someplace is. But uh, yes, it is from a single company perspective that's helping a heck of a lot of growers through a co-op. Okay, great. Uh, certainly, we're always happy to hear about new innovations, particularly if they're win-wins that offer additional food security and create business and, and additional prosperity. That's, that's a good thing all the way around. Uh, I think probably the most, um, most readily available uh, entry point for you into the process is probably through the economic section at the embassy in Mexico City, or if you're concentrated more in one of the consular districts, perhaps through the consulate there. Uh, but I, they can help figure out where you might best fit into any of these other uh, these other efforts that are going on. There is is there a specific name or someplace where that point of entry could be easier? Um, 
let me, why don't you see me afterwards? I, I don't want to blast out digits just broadly, I, <laughs> but, but I'm more than happy to provide you some points of contact. Okay, just keep in mind because that, I mean, what we're looking at is, is uh, consolidated purchasing. We're looking at, you know, it, technology right. platforms. Uh, CUP is one of the, you know, big data stuff that we're, we're looking at. So, I mean, this is a, a very, very integrated supply chain system that it's it's coming together pretty nicely. Okay, the other thing that um, that we're going to be doing is having some stakeholder engagements for the high-level economic dialogue where we'll be inviting people to come and talk about what they see as challenges and opportunities in the supply chain environment, and that might also be an opportunity for you as well. Super, thank you. I do think checking with the Embassy of Mexico, both with the economic, commercial, and ag sections, maybe they can help direct you to, to the best person to help out in that. But thank you all very much. And thank you very much, Catherine and Chris. And thank you, Gina, for being with us. Um, it's been a great conversation. Appreciate very much all that you're doing and all that you've shared with us. And thanks to everybody for being here. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you all for being here.